following show is controversial and contains content you may find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. 98 FM Dublin Talks. Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Good morning. It is Thursday morning, Thursday, May 30th, 2019. I hope everything is good with you. I'm Adrian Kennedy. And between now and midday today, this is 98 FM's Dublin Talks. The mid-morning talk and phone-in show for Dublin, by Dublin and about Dublin. In just a moment, we have a warning for the women of Dublin. And a very serious warning for the women of Dublin about a serial rapist who has been released back into our society and is amongst us as of today. This man is so notorious that uh, he is indirectly responsible for a new law having been brought in here in Ireland which will see uh, repeat rape offenders uh, getting much longer sentences. I'll explain who he is and what the story is uh, in uh, in just a moment. Also on today's programme, 45% of men have said they fear going bald more than being single for the rest of their lives. Really? Um... I want to find out, are you one of those men? Have you gone bald? Did it affect your confidence? And if so, why? I want to try and get my head around it. I'm in kind of a fortunate situation that I'm not really losing my hair. I'm not right head of hair. Receded a bit, but nothing much. Um, so, I, you know, it's not really an issue for me. I would like to talk to men later on uh, for whom this is an issue. Also, we'll be talking to a um, Dublin woman shortly who's desperately trying to get her 93-year-old uh, dad out of hospital and back home. However, they're being pressured to put him into a nursing home, which he does not want. And much more besides. Uh, between now and midday today and live from Dublin City Centre... This is Adrian Kennedy, and this is 98FM's Dublin Talks. Now, first on the programme. One of Ireland's most notorious serial sex offenders is back on the streets of uh, Dublin after he was released from uh, prison. Robert Melia, who is now in his 50s, was released from custody and uh, is set to live in Dublin city centre. He has multiple previous rape allegations over decades. In one, he threatened to chop his victim up as he uh, sexually assaulted her. Now, um, one... I have to, by the way, give a bit of a warning that the... uh, The details of what you're about to hear are not pleasant, I have to warn you. Um, A lady that really took a a four-year campaign to get a new law uh, brought in is one of uh, this man's victims. In 1989, uh, Debbie Cole was raped by Robert Melia. And he subsequently, now this is 1989, so we're talking 30 years ago, but this guy subsequently went on to reoffend and reoffend and reoffend to the point that um, my first guest on the programme today launched a, a national campaign to bring in what is essentially being called now Debbie Cole's Law. Um, and Debbie joins me on the line. Debbie, welcome to 98 FM. Thanks, Adrian. How are you, love? Good, thank you. Uh, Debbie... Firstly, tell me, uh, I want to find out about the new law and how it, it will work. Um, but firstly, tell me about this guy, Robert Mealy. It's a name that we have heard. It's a name that mm-hmm. has been thrown around. Um, but tell me about this guy and your first interaction with him. Uh, well, my first interaction with him at the beginning was very pleasant. He seemed like a very nice, respectable man and didn't have me on guard at all. There was no red flag to make me feel nervous around him. Mm-hmm. And then um, when we had, he had shared a taxi home with his friend and myself. And then when we got home, she had ran on up to her home and I was standing talking to him for a few minutes. And then when I went to walk, say goodbye and walk up the stairs, he pulled me back down by the hair and put a knife up again in my throat and uh, raped me. And that went on for a number of hours. He tried to kill me during the attack. 
when we heard somebody coming down the stairs. Um, it was in the block of flats in Ballymun that I was living in at the time. And then I thought it was a week later to the day he was arrested and he still had my name and address in his pocket. He pled not guilty for two years. And then the first day of the trial, he changed his plea to guilty. So needless to say, that was a major relief for me. Mm -hmm. And then the judge put him in a jail for two weeks while the judge was deciding what sentence to give. And during that time, a guard sergeant had come over to me and started telling me that this Robert Mealy was a lovely man. He was very respectable, came from a lovely family. And that this was so out of character for him. This was a mistake he'd made with a few drinks on him. And he felt so bad for what he'd done. He tried to commit suicide in prison. And if I could see my way to speaking up for him in the court, that would help a lot, that he needed psychiatric help and... Of course, I didn't understand a lot back then about rapists and what's in them that makes them do this. So I believed the the guards, oh, look, we all make mistakes with drink on us. So I did speak up for him. And the judge significantly lowered his sentence. And then he was sentenced back into prison and tried to commit suicide again. And from there was sent to the Central Mental Hospital in Dundrum. And he started sending me out love letters. Now, I'd never met the man before the night of the rape. Mm. And then his sister showed up at my home and said that he was threatening suicide if I didn't go and see him, that he wanted to apologise, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of, I was only 21, but I was a very naive 21 compared to 21-year-olds now. And I thought, oh, God, if he dies, that's my fault. So I went and sat across the table from him and told him, look, you made a mistake. Move on with your life. Do your time. Come out and make a life for yourself. And then I came home and it all kind of came on top of me then. And I tried to commit suicide because I hadn't dealt with the trauma of Of what what he had done. Mm. Yeah. And then that was, my mum got in touch with his family and said, if there's any more contact, I'm notifying the guards. So there was none. And then the next time I heard his name was in 1997, when he was in the media for being, uh, he'd been charged and sentenced for the rape of three women within a one month period in Dublin. Uh, these uh, these three victims were working as prostitutes at the time of uh, his attacks. Um, I understand at the time he posed as like an English visitor and a football yeah. fan in Dublin for an All-Ireland semi-final when he approached the women. Uh, yeah. So this was premeditated. Oh, yeah. Definitely premeditated. Now... As a result of those attacks in 1997, so this is um, eight years after he attacked you, he was at it again, uh, uh, out yeah. of prison and at it again um, and attacked three uh, different uh, women. Uh, yep. he, he falsely imprisoned four women. Uh, wow. And he, so he was subsequently sentenced for these offences again. Then when he was released from that sentence, he was re-sentenced again in 2015 for a violent attack on a woman. And where you were describing at the beginning of the show there, where he she had to jump out the hotel window to get away from him mm-hmm. because he threatened to bring her up the Dublin mountains and kill him. With the result, the judge in that case has referred to him as another Larry Murphy. That's how serious this guy is. Right, so he admitted in this particular case, this is back in 2013, he... 2015. Uh, oh, he, but he was, he, sorry, he was sentenced in 15, was he? Yeah. Yeah, uh, he admitted charges of false imprisonment, assault causing harm, and making threats to kill. So this is yeah. only a couple of years ago, and it yeah. is from that sentence... So this is the third uh, uh, sentence that this man has uh, been given for rape and sexual assault and false imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And he is now back on the streets again. Yeah, because when the judge was handing down the sentence, which 
it, I mean, I'm not a legal person, so maybe there's some legal person listening that can explain why this makes sense. But he's proven over and over again that he's going to reoffend. But the judge said in the sentence that he was going to put him under a good behaviour order for three years, like suspend the last three years of his sentence, providing he was of good behaviour. And I'm reading that phone. What part of his behaviour in the past has shown that he is capable of being on good behaviour upon release? Because as soon as he's released, he reoffends and somebody is attacked. So that just didn't make sense to me. I thought, you know, how can an intelligent person like a judge come to that conclusion? How in his head does that make sense? Okay, and it is for this reason, uh, Debbie, that uh, you spent a number of years trying to get the law changed here in Ireland, uh, Mm -hmm. which was successful, it has to be said, uh, so that anybody else who re-offends on a sex crime um, within 10 years of being released from prison after serving at least five years, the judge must give them a sentence of no less than 15 years. Yes. So that is the law that is essentially being called uh, Debbie Cole's law that will see people like this guy, repeat offenders, never learn their lesson uh, and just keep doing it over and over again. If he were to re-offend again, he faces 15 years in jail. At least. As a result of the law that you campaign for. Yes. But the sad part about it is that even though he is a repeat offender, um, he won't be jailed for 15 years unless, God forbid, he commits another offence. Yeah. And this is the worry, um, that this man has been released from prison and, to the best of our knowledge, is living in Dublin city centre right now. Yeah, he was released yesterday morning. Now, what I can't understand as well is that when we say somebody has been released from prison, a serious offender, and they're under a probation order, a supervision order, or a good behaviour order, why we don't have electronic tagging in this system? Don't understand it myself. It just doesn't make sense to me. No, Mm. because I haven't had to really think about him for years. But because of all the... We say our names being connected again in the media because of the the bill that I had passed, I kind of was feeling okay when he gets out now, is he going to come after me for revenge or that kind of thing. But and is, think, is this a thought in your head, Debbie? It is, yes. It, it, it's a definite thought. I've been uh, speaking to the local crime prevention officer and everything. He's I went and bought a person an alarm and all that kind of stuff for walking around, so I feel a bit safer. Because at the minute, the only photograph that I have is the ones from the media, which are a number of years old. Mm. So I, at this stage, don't know what he even looks like. like. That is is scary. Right. Because every person that I pass, I'm looking, is that him? Is that him? Is that him? Okay, but the, what, what we know is, um, from what, what I've uh, been led to believe, he is living in some sort of emergency accommodation in the city centre, and yeah. he is, because of the nature of that emergency accommodation, um, he'd be thrown out in the morning and probably walking around the streets all day. Exactly. And that was only for, he was, as far as I know, he was guaranteed that bed for last night, but um, I don't know about any other night. He has seven days. Uh, in which to present himself to a Garda station with a permanent dress. But, as I said to the guard, well, what happens if he doesn't? How are they going to find him? Because they don't know where he is, but mm. he's homeless. You know, so the whole system is flawed. Absolutely. Um, OK, this guy's name is Robert Melia. He is a repeat offender, has been jailed uh, three on three separate occasions for three separate, uh, well, actually for multiple rapes, but yeah. for se- uh, three uh, separate convictions, uh, released from prison yesterday and walking around our streets today. Unfortunately, we don't have an up-to-date picture of this guy, uh, which would be very helpful if we did, mm-hmm. but we don't. Um, and you believe, and this is the key to this uh, whole thing, Debbie, because of his history, because of his track record, you believe that it is only a matter of time before he attacks another woman. Unfortunately, yes. How terrifying. 
It's absolutely dreadful. I was sitting here last night and the television was on and all I kept thinking in my head was, is he attacking somebody now? Is he attacking somebody now? Right. Okay. Well, I, I, like I said, we don't have an up-to-date photograph of him. Maybe somebody has come in contact with him over the last um, 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And if they have, they might um, let us know where he is. because yeah, that'd be great. Uh, because we need to be aware that this guy is walking amongst us today. And uh, women in particular need to be especially careful of this guy because he has a disgusting, horrible, nasty track record. And as, as you said, Debbie, sadly, it is only a matter of time before he reoffends. And let's hope that that doesn't come to pass. Plus um, the fact that he's so charming and nice that he, your, your defences break down so you don't feel threatened by him. So... We kind of have in our head, oh, he's an evil so-and-so. So you're looking out for this evil-looking mm. person. But he's just a normal-looking man, dressed normally and speaks very respectfully. So be on your guard for everyone. And somebody just texted in, uh, please, 98 of them, ask if anybody has a recent picture or a current address for this guy, could they please post uh, publicly? We don't, is the answer to that. No. Um, and it would be very helpful if we did, but we don't uh, at yeah. this moment. The most recent photograph is from uh, court appearance years ago. Yeah. Debbie, for, uh, finally, I, I just want to congratulate you on uh, getting that law passed that uh, if somebody, and this was passed back in February, if somebody yeah. like Robert Melia is to reoffend again, he will go away for uh, a very long time, up to life in prison. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen. In Well, I suppose that's a bit contradictory. I'd love him to be locked away yeah, for the rest of his days, but I hope it doesn't come to pass that he actually attacks uh, somebody Don't else. Like. But it's to your credit uh, Debbie, the amount of work and effort that you put into getting that law passed uh, that will hopefully stop people like this guy uh, reoffending. And I really appreciate on a difficult day for you, it has to be really difficult uh, knowing in the back of your mind that that guy's out there again. But I really appreciate you talking to me again today, Debbie. No problem. And I've had great support from family and friends and other rape survivors sending me messages of support. So, you know, people are very good people in general are very mm. good and I've had kind of great help from you guys all the way through the campaign highlighting it and talking about it so they kind of put pressure on the government to get the bill passed so I couldn't have done it without all the the help from family, friends and media Alright, well we're delighted to have been a, a, a small part of it uh, Debbie Cole, thanks very much indeed for talking to thanks, us Thanks Adrian, bye Alright, there you go Sends a shiver up my spine just thinking of that guy walking around in this city right now um, and like I said, if anybody has any contact, had any contact with him and uh, gets a photograph of him, please send it to us, to 98FM. Now, uh, on the way after the break, if you care for an elderly parent or parents, we want to talk to you about how difficult it is. Do you get enough help from the state? We'd be speaking to a Dublin woman who's desperately trying to get her 93-year-old dad home. We're back in just a moment. 98FM. Dublin Talks with Des Kelly Interiors for all the latest trends in carpets, vinyls and wood flooring. Des Kelly Interiors where quality flooring costs less. 98 FM. And this is Adrian Kennedy with you until uh, midday today. Uh, broadcaster and long-term colleague uh, of all the staff here at 98 FM, Tina Gates, has taken to social media to express her frustration about not being able to take her 93-year-old father home from hospital despite being physically well. Uh, Tina has said her dad, uh, Terry, and her family are being pressurised to place him in a nursing home even though they've expressed that they don't want this to happen. Her dad now needs 24-hour care following a fall which led to a head injury which in turn accelerated his dementia. He turns 94 next Wednesday. Um, and Tina joins me on the line. Tina, welcome to the programme. Hello, Adrian. I never thought I'd be on with you telling you my story. I'm used to be telling other, other people's, people's stories, stories yeah. indeed. Um, Tina, what led to you uh, posting on social media about this situation with your dad? Well, to be honest with you, I was tapping away um, on my mobile phone, just literally putting a post up on Facebook about 
how upset I was. And it didn't start out intentionally as being an open letter to the minister. But uh, by the time that I pressed send, that's exactly what I was after doing. Mm. And it was a, a letter that I didn't... Um, plan, didn't proofread I just press send and 2,000 shares later um, it's caused quite a lot of interest and uh, you know the thing about it is I was deeply and am deeply upset and confused and torn about the situation that I find myself in but hundreds of people have contacted me openly, publicly on Twitter and Facebook saying they're in the same situation and even worse Hundreds more have said that their loved ones have died while they've been in the same situation. Okay, so tell me the situation with your uh, with your dad. And I've met I've met you with your dad, mm-hmm. and you've cared for your dad over many years. Tell me about your dad's current situation. Yeah, he, he, unfortunately, seven weeks ago he had a fall. Um, and we were out shopping. I mean, just to give you, a, you know, dad's, as you say, 94 next week. But, you know, before anybody thinks that he's, you know, a typical sort of um, 90 plus man, this this guy, you know, he climbs ladders and mows lawns. I mean, mm. he's Superman. He's Mr. Action Man. And, um, and he's I, never... I, I'm very fortunate myself to have a 97 year old oh. grandmother who's the exact same. Uh, oh, that's she's wonderful. An, yeah, she's an amazing woman. But uh, sadly, your dad had a fall yeah. uh, a couple of weeks back. Yeah. Uh, and and it hasn't been good. No, he he was. Uh, we had to bring him to A and E. That even itself wasn't good. We had uh, we, we when people rang nine nine nine, they were told that. And there was a two-hour wait for an ambulance, even though he was unconscious on the road. So we peeled him up, got him into my car, and I drove him um, to A&E at Connolly Hospital. Now, it turned out that he had broken um, his orbital bone. That's the the bone behind his eye. So he'd broken a bone in his eye socket. Um, He had some terrible wounds on his hands and and cuts and trauma. But the most important thing was he had a bleed on the brain. So um, he was admitted with a little twos and fro's. He was admitted to to Woodlands because he was actually released out of A and E, and we had to bring him back two days later when he got worse. But he was um, um, admitted into Woodlands a medical unit in Connolly Hospital, who have been magnificent, mm-hmm. and they should not, you know, get any shrapnel from what I'm talking about because these. The people on the front line have just been magnificent. And so has the social worker who's been dealing with his case. But in he went to hospital and he badly needed it. He was in a terrible state. He, as I say, this broken bone, bad wounds, needed dressing on his hands every day. Um, And they fixed him. They healed him. They put him back together. I thought I had lost my father when he lost consciousness when he hit the road. Mm. And I thought I'd lost my father when it seemed like his brain had completely given up the ghost. But he went into Woodlands and they fixed him and they gave me back my father. Okay, but and, and uh, but here, here now is the problem, <laughs> that the solution to your dad's situation uh, from their point of view, from the medical side, is to put him into a nursing home, uh, but this is not a solution that you or your uh, dad want. You're looking for a home care package so that he can go home. Um, well, in fairness now, the, the, the medical team, they're happy for him to go home with a home care package. Um, they say that he needs 24 our care because he has an acquired brain injury and mm-hmm. that it doesn't mean that he's uh, like he's totally able to have a conversation with you um, he's been discussing the elections with me um, but his ability to not get himself into difficulty has gone mm. so I mean he could um, put his hand into a, a, a boiling fat to see what the temperature was like he could walk out the door and uh, walk underneath a bus without you know so he needs care okay but the the issue here is that home care package and not being able to get it yeah we've been on a waiting list and all I'm being told is that he has been prioritized and he will be dealt with as soon as possible and that's been going on for weeks Meanwhile, my dad is looking at me every evening when I leave him in the hospital where he's sitting beside a bed that somebody else needs as badly as Mm. we needed it seven weeks ago. He's looking at me with his big blue eyes and saying, but why can't I go home with you? And it's tearing me apart. All I want is for my father to be at home with me. I'm really happy to look after him. I'm able to pay for a little care myself, but... 
basically the medical profession are saying that it's not quite enough that I do need this home care package and they're reluctant to have him discharged until that package is in place. Now, that leaves me torn between ignoring everybody's advice and just doing what I want to do, which is to grab him up in my arms and run like the wind and bring him home. But then am I putting him in danger by doing that? Or do I leave him there and see my relationship with him being destroyed because I'm beginning to think he doesn't believe that I want him home anymore? Mm. And every day I go to see him, his eyes are a little sadder and he's a little bit more confused because he's in a situation that, with the best will in the world, they're doing a wonderful job, but he wants to be home and he's stressing and he's getting upset and he's getting agitated and he's fading. I mean, he's 94 next week. I don't and he doesn't have time to run campaigns and plead and beg for the ability to bring him home. I mean, we have an ageing population. The government has made it totally clear that they're in favour of independent living and supporting people in the community and if you open the HSE website it says that support packages are available. Now when we talk about support packages the maximum package that we're talking about is 21 hours. Now, 21 already, hours in a week? 21 hours in a week. Now bear with me for a moment because I already pay a private company to help me out when I'm on a long shifter. You know, I already had somebody coming in to just keep an eye on him anyhow. And I pay €25 an hour for a carer from a private um, company. So if I can get that for €25 an hour, I'm sure the government can. So on that maths, that means that that 21-hour maximum package that, that they can provide is in or around 500 euros. Meanwhile, there's thousands being spent on a bed he doesn't need. Mm. I mean, And indeed, a nursing home would cost more than that as well. Well, here's the rub. I mean, the, the, the easy option that everybody seems to be directing me towards is a nursing home. Dad and I have had this conversation. Dad doesn't want to go into a nursing home, and it's his right to live where he wants to live. Like, if it had come to a stage where he didn't recognise me, didn't recognise his, his, his house, his dog, his chair, but that's not the case. We are so far away from a nursing home. I am totally convinced if I were to go down that road, I'd be waving goodbye to my father. I don't think he'd last a week. At, you know, I just think his soul would, would die overnight. And, and I'm not being dramatic about that because mm. my dad has spoken to me for years about how he wants to spend his final days on this planet. And it's not in a nursing home. And I want to honour that, but I think as well that the state has an obligation to honour that. This man... And uh, has... Sorry, Tina, to cut across you, but uh, mm. you, you have touched on a raw nerve here with uh, listeners because I know an awful lot of people are going through the exact same thing that you are uh, where it comes to home care and the availability of home care packages and the amount of hours set aside for home care packages um, for um, people who want to be at home. Uh, and this is a huge issue that is being ignored by the looks of it. Well, I have been, as a journalist, writing stories for the last number of years about how, you know, brilliant it is that the government is investing in independent living and care in the community. And that was an area that was slightly of interest to me because I had an elderly father. But I never realised the extent of the problem in that, you know, we've been talking about Trolley Watch for years. But now do we need a home watch? Because, I mean, they're the two ends of the scale and it's not difficult to do the maths. You have hundreds of people waiting on trolleys, but you also have hundreds of people waiting to go home. And I have been shocked by the stories that have been brought to me over the last few days. And, in fact, I was just contacted last night by a group that I hadn't personally heard of before called um, Sage Advocacy. And they've been looking at this entire area and they're looking at the Fair Deal package and they're even recently have um, um, sent out a statement about calling for a new deal to look again at the fair deal system and, and the way that we provide for vulnerable people in our society, people who want to go into a home, but people who also want to stay in the community and be in their own homes. And like, it, it just seems incredible to me that we, we have a census in this country, like we know 
the age of the population. So it's not a surprise to know how many people are getting old. So we shouldn't have to suddenly scrabble looking for pennies when somebody turns up in a hospital. We should have these packages ready to roll, ready to go out in the community. There are there is an abundance of people who are actually trained and looking for work as carers. I know this because I've been interviewing for carers ever since this situation has cropped up with Dad because I've gone out looking to see who I could hire to bring mm. into my own home. And every story that I'm hearing is the fact that, that there are people out there who are trained, who care, who are tied, who can't get work or who are tied into running in and out doing half-hour visits. And that's a whole other day story how on Absolutely. earth do you deliver care in a half hour? But the point is that these home care packages that we're advertising as being there and ready available to allow independent living... Really aren't. They're not. Mm. Well, in fact, you mentioned an organisation uh, a second ago, Tina, Sage Ireland, and uh, Valerie uh, Cox from Sage Ireland joins me on the line. Uh, another friend of mine, as it happens, so I have loads oh. of friends around me here. Um, Adrian, yeah. <laughs> Valerie, welcome to the programme. This is a huge problem that isn't just affecting Tina and her dad. Not at all, Adrian. It's something that Sage Advocacy staff are finding more and more, that older people, vulnerable people, they've been in hospital maybe for a long time, a short time, they're ready to go home, but the difficulty is in getting those care packages in place because obviously they need a bit of support to be there. In some cases, it can be, you know, maybe an hour a day or something, in cases like Tina's father, as she's described, it can be much longer. But, you know, I think the problem is that we are now underlining the need for a statutory system of proper home care provision. And what we've done in SAGE Advocacy is um, we see a need to develop a special fund for people who have, say, sudden onset conditions like a stroke or acquired brain injury. Now, the care needs can be considerable. But they're competing, contending with the needs of the general population of older people as well who are in need of support. So we've just published a discussion document called New Deal. And this would be our idea for funding long-term support and care. And what we're asking is, we're calling it the Fair Deal, and we're urging that the nursing home support scheme, that's the Fair Deal, and home care should be integrated into one system, one streamlined system, and that would be funded by social insurance and inheritance tax. Now, Adrian, we all know we've got to pay for these services. They're very expensive services. And that's why, instead of saying in certain areas of the country, somebody's ready to go home from a hospital, but there is no support package, no home care package in place for them. What we want to do is make this a statutory system where the care is there, is ready, for somebody who needs it. And, you know, the other thing which Tina has highlighted as well is that some people mightn't have that much longer in their own homes, you know, whether it's age or inability or illness. So, you know, we really owe it to our older and vulnerable people to give them the best quality of life Mm. for whatever time they've got. And as, as I said, Valerie, this is, um, isn't just affecting uh, Tina, it is affecting an awful lot of people and we've touched on a raw nerve. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much time, but Valerie, if anybody wants to find out any more about your proposals, where do they go? Oh, they can go to our website, Sage Advocacy, and we have all the details, all the documents up there, or they can even get in touch with us, email or ring us, everything is on the website. Uh, Valerie Cox, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm going to take a very uh, quick break. After the break, uh, just one or two more stories on this. Um, And um, Michael, you're shocked listening to what you're listening to. Uh, It's a disgrace, Adrian. Disgrace. I'll be with you straight after the break. 98 FM. Dublin Talks. With Des Kelly Interiors. For all the latest trends in carpets, vinyls and wood flooring. Des Kelly Interiors, where quality flooring costs less. 98 FM. And this is Adrian Kennedy. We're just going to take one or two more calls on this. Um, And this is a huge uh, issue. And we're talking about the lack of availability of a home care package for many elderly people who don't want to go to a nursing home, who want to be in their own home. We've been hearing from uh, our colleague Tina Uh, telling a story of her 93-year-old dad who wants to be at home, but the home care package just isn't available. Or they can make minutes available, but not enough to 
to uh, let him go back home. And uh, uh, Tina, the point you were making to us a moment ago was that every day you can see your dad's yeah, I mean, going downhill, like, basically, because yeah, he just me, doesn't want to be there. He's he's going to be celebrating his 94th birthday next week. Mm. And, you know, in, in Dad's mind and in all of ours, we want to be doing that in his favourite restaurant with a steak. And he's in hospital. And I'm reassuring him that somehow we're going to make that happen. I've no idea how, how mm. but, 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 but I want to. And I'll do something, even if it means kidnapping him for the day mm. but the thing is that he's getting he's not getting stimulated in hospital they're wonderful to him they're looking after him they've fixed all his wounds but they like he needs his chair his dog his garden these are the things that he's worrying about that he's but, uh, but sadly the only way that that can happen is if he gets granted a full home care package which just isn't happening well, you see, I feel, uh, as I said before, I feel totally, completely torn because what I want to do is just grab him and run. But then everybody's saying to me, you know, if you do that, you're bringing him home and then maybe you won't be looking and or you'll be tired because you haven't slept during the night and something will happen to him and mm. that's on you. All right, let me, let me read a couple of messages. Um, uh, one says, carers need to be uh, better paid because they are totally undervalued. Carers are leaving by uh, the dozen. And another message, uh, quite interesting. Uh, I worked as a community carer for 15 years. I loved it, but I had to leave because of the system. Leaving a client after a 30-minute visit it's not only heartbreaking, but also when you are going from area to area for 30 minute visits, it's completely exhausting. Um, the system is completely wrong, says that. And it has to be on a human level very difficult for um, uh, carers like that to go in for 30 minutes, knowing full well that this person actually needs more than 30 minutes of care. Um, Michael is in Carrick Mines. Uh, Michael, what's your reaction to this story? Uh, um Thanks, Tina, first of all, for, for speaking about this. You know, and thanks to the station for <clears throat> raising this. This is um, this, oh, this annoys me. I mean, they've no they've no respect for family whatsoever, um, and they don't support family at all. And it's clear and it's evident to my mind. Um, no, I do know of a few situations myself. And there, another another thing as well is there's a lot of elderly people out there who don't have family, and you know what when they. They're kept in nursing homes, and then they don't. They, they, their houses, their bank accounts, their pensions go straight to the government as well. So that's right. That's that, that, right. There's a bit of a racket in it, you know. Um, and as Tina said, there's an abundance of people out there to help um, trained people, and it doesn't take rocket science to figure out a system where we can help our elderly people who would basically, you know, without them we wouldn't be here. And in the future, the same thing will be. In, like, we'll be all be all short enough, you know, and. What are our kids going to be like with us, um, and what will the system be like when we're elderly? Like so, I personally yes. I mean, this is in all of our interest to exactly yeah. try and get this system sorted out. Yeah, because we we, we will all now. be old one day sooner than you believe. Mm. All right, um, Claire is in South Dublin. Claire, welcome to ninety eight FM. Hi, how are you? Your mum was in hospital for 18 uh, months. What did, you want to, months yeah. what did you want to say on this? Um, well, my mum was in hospital and in order to get the care package, she had to just wait um, until it was in place to come home. She we were advised by the doctor and um, she had an operation that went wrong and she needed to be completely re rehabilitated again, taught how to swallow, taught how to walk, everything from scratch all over again. And we were told that she would need the full package to 21 hours. And after a year and a half of fighting, we got 12. So that's yeah. uh, my mum needs more or less help 24 hours a day. Um, she can't go to the bathroom by herself, can't do anything. So And the, uh, the care that has been provided by the state is 12, 12 hours, hours a week? 12 hours a week, wow. that's it. And, Out of 168 um, I, hours in a week? Yeah. 12. So I live with my mom with my two children and we pick up the rest. I work four days a week so um, in those 12 hours that happens I'm um, I'm on work. So once I come home from work the nighttime job kicks in. 
He, and uh, like I said, um, Claire, you're not the only one in this no, in this trap. No, um, uh, there's so many uh, people in exactly this uh, mm-hmm. situation, and the the, the ridiculously uh, the ridiculous reality of this is that for the state, it actually saves money if people yeah. are at home, uh, yeah. even if it means providing more and more hours of uh, of care. It's still saving the state money. Especially and when I hear some of the rates of pay that some of the carers are on, it's disgraceful. The poor carers, they're coming in and like to be starting at half seven in the morning and to be working until 10 o'clock that night with maybe an hour um, during the day as a break. So they're on the road running around like and it's a very physical job and they're exhausted. And you can see why they don't last in the position it's very long. Um, do you get any like, sleep at all, Claire? Uh, yeah, I do. In fairness, uh, I do. But we, uh, it's hard going. It can be, it's, it's physical. Um and we're up very early and we're in bed very late. So it probably get five, six hours sleep a night. Um, and then I have a six year old, so if she gets up or has a nightmare, she's in or whatever, you know, so it's 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 hard work. It is very hard work and I don't think people realise how hard it can be because you're prepping meals because the carers don't cook. So you have to have the meals already for the carers when they come in the next day. So if there's breakfast ready and because the hour that they have, they need to use it to kind of um, do toileting or mm. a few bits of exercises or bring for a walk or whatever. Because um, if they're cooking, then my mom is left sitting in the chair and she won't get any exercise because she can't walk around without somebody with her. So you have to have everything prepared. So all their tablets are prepared and laid out the night before. Um, any administration work all has to be done. Um like for my mom so you could spend your day off basically like on a Monday I don't go to work mm. so I spend the whole day could be doing doctor's appointments running to get tablets running to get prescriptions filled wow it's, so it's, it's really like, intense yeah yeah so I, I and it, say I'll come to work but your, your point to <laughs> Tina was not Absolutely even th- do not do not no. take her, your dad home, no. Tina, without having a care package in place. And I know once they think that you can cope. Yes, they they'll, they'll just leave you at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, I, I don't know how close you are to deciding that, Tina. Well, first of all, Claire, is it? Claire, yeah, yeah. It is Claire. Yeah, I look at my heart goes out to you, and and thank you, and and I think you're very brave to actually come on and outline all that's involved because I know how you know conflicted it feels to do that because you feel as if you're making a burden of it and it's not and I know I can hear the love and the care in your voice and you know so thank you you know I really do appreciate that and And like your father will feel as if then like I know my mom does she goes I'm such a burden I'm such a burden she keeps on beating herself up and it's not that it's just that you're so frustrated that like that the help isn't there. There's nobody calling. They like they basically want to get out of the hospital. They'll check in once every six months, and um, like the health nurses or the the cognitive therapists and all that, they check in. But it's literally just a check in to take a box on a piece of paper to say. So the point done. being, wait to get at least some oh, care yeah, package yeah. in place yeah. before bringing dad home. Thanks when very much, yeah. Claire. I appreciate your uh, your call. Let me just wrap up with. Uh, one final uh, well, WhatsApp voice message that has come in to us that I just want to uh, squeeze in before uh, we wrap this up. And here it is here. So sad to hear all of those stories. I know exactly what they're going through. It was the same with my mom, And it's just worth mentioning as well that when they say that they're giving you an hour, if you need two people there to help assist or dress, the state count that as two hours. So in reality, it isn't anywhere near 21 hours. It's an absolute disgrace. People work their whole lives, pay their taxes, and they don't get looked after. It's so, so sad to see. Tina, I wish you the best of luck uh, next you. week with your dad for his birthday, and I hope you manage to take him to that favourite restaurant for uh, for a bite to eat and see the dog again and everything else. And um, Sage Ireland, as you heard from Valerie a while ago, are the people to to talk to because they're they're dealing with this, they're working on it as we speak. Tina Gates, thanks very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you. And if you want to find out more information, Sage Ireland is the organisation that that lady Valerie was from uh, just a while ago. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. I'm Adrian Kennedy. After the break, what is your pet peeve about public transport? 
Live and exclusive to Dublin's 98FM, Monday through Friday between 10 and midday, this is Adrian Kennedy. You're with 98FM's Dublin Talks. And Georgie is here with Thursday's top headlines. Thanks, Adrian. Good morning. The Taoiseach has been criticised after stating he'd visit the north side of Dublin as soon as he can find a little bit more time. Three gangland shootings have taken place on the north side in the space of a week. Labour Senator Aon O'Reardon wants a review to take place in Dublin 17, similar to the report commissioned to help regenerate the north inner city. The Road Safety Authority is urging people to stop rubbernecking at the scene of a crash. Moya Murdoch from the RSA also wants people to stop videoing incidents on the roads. And WhatsApp is to introduce ads next year. It would work in a sim- similarly to how the ads appear on Instagram stories with a swipe up function if users want to find out more. Now you're up to date on 98. 98. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Well, how are you today? I'm Adrian Kennedy, and between now and uh, midday today, this is 98 FM's Dublin Talks, the mid morning talk and phone in show for Dublin, by Dublin, and about Dublin. I have a question for you that I want you to answer for me. I want you to text or WhatsApp me right now on 0877 98 98 98. And here's the question that I want you to answer for me. What is the one thing that annoys you about public transport? Now, that can be the Lewis or the Dart or Dublin bus or bus Aaron or even a taxi, I suppose. It's public transport, isn't it? So what is the one thing that just oh, does your head in about using uh, public transport? The reason I mentioned this, uh, I, uh, I took to social media the other day about something that just does my head in. As you may know, uh, I regularly get the bus into work. I park my car and I get the bus the rest of the way into work uh, because parking around here is a nightmare and expensive and everything else. So it's easier just to park my car at a place that I can park it for free and hop on the bus and come into work. Anyway, do that most days of the week. Not every day, but a lot of days uh, of the week I do that. However, one of my pet hates is getting on the bus. This happened the other day. And two or three or four or even more people are sitting on the bus alongside uh, their bag. In other words, they sit, they sit on the, uh, the bus seat and they uh, have their bag on uh, the next seat beside them. Now, a bag doesn't need a seat. A bag can go on the floor. But uh, these people decide to put their bag on the other half of the seat on the bus, hoping that nobody else is going to come and join them and that they can have the two seats all to themselves. And it absolutely wrecks my head. Um, and if the bus is full, I will make an effort to just stand there and gawk at the person until they move their bag and I can sit down. Uh, and I know, certainly from, from putting it on uh, social media... Uh, the other day, an awful lot of people uh, have this exact same problem. They hate it, and they will do exactly what I do. They stand there and wait for the person to move their bag. Look, here's the thing. Putting the bag on the seat is not going to keep the seat for you if the bus is full. So why bother in the first place? Are you afraid of people sitting beside you? Anyway, it raises a whole uh, conversation about your pet hate on public transport. Um, text or WhatsApp me right now on 0877 989898. 0877 What is the one thing on public transport that just does your head in? That one is mine. People putting their bags on the seats, hoping that nobody is going to come and take the other uh, seat, hoping that they're going to be left uh, alone for their entire journey. Uh, and sometimes it works. But I have actually insisted on sitting on a seat where I didn't have to because there was another seat, but just because the bag was there. 
just so that I could disrupt the bag. It annoys me that much. It wrecks my head. Um, call me right now on 6797981. Better still, um, uh, you can text or WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice message to 0877 98 98 98. Let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice message. Adrian, what does my head in with public transport is, like, I'm tall, so I have long legs, and I'm on the loose, and I find a seat where I can, you know, just sit there, grand, and there's loads of seats available. Some L1 always sits in front of you and takes up the space for your legs. All right, um, let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice note. When there's loads of free seats on the bus and someone sits beside you. Yeah, that is a head wreck. I'd agree. Uh, that actually happened to me the other day. Uh, so I'm sitting on uh, a seat on the bus and I didn't have my bag on the seat. My bag was on my lap and there was loads of free seats on the bus and this weirdo came and sat right beside me. There was other free empty seats and he decided to sit beside me. It kind of freaked me out a little bit, to be quite honest with you. Uh, so I can totally relate to uh, that pet hate. What is your pet hate on uh, public transport? Kev, you're on 98FM. How are you, Kev? Good morning, Adrian. Oh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> I, today, yeah, that kind of winds me up as well. Bridge the bag thing. Yeah, because oh. it's a bit arrogant. It's a bit, like, self-important. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you don't need it. Just, you've got legs. Put it mm. between your legs on the floor. Anyway, uh People who open windows on a bus in a, in the, in kind of October to September when it's cold, yes, no need for it at all. And like, don't worry, I've, I I it, it winds me up to it when it's not necessary. And I've I've approached people and said, look, do you really need that open? And they kind of go, oh, oh, oh and they shut it as quick with embarrassment. But doesn't like it's a, if a bit, bus is a bit steamy, it's because there's. Yes, it can be a bit steamy, yeah. yeah. yeah but but like, okay, people, like, people who open the uh, the windows on the bus on a bloody freezing day. Yeah, yeah. No if, you, if you want your own condition, air conditioning, get your own car. Um, you know what? The rest of us on the bus don't want it. Most of the time, people like they, they tut and sigh and look at each other. No, like I, I am the type of person who I would say, look, you really need that open. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, we're all trying to. Yeah, no, you're dead. You're dead right. A lot of people just sit there freezing, uh, yeah, rather than rather than saying a word. Okay, so people who open the window on the bus on a cold morning, uh, does that do your head in? We're asking you, what is the one thing on public transport, and the, this doesn't have to be the bus. It can be the Dart or the Lewis or a taxi or whatever. But what is the one thing on public transport that just does your head in? Mine is. People putting their bags on seats on the bus. It's not... The bag doesn't need a seat. Get rid of your bag uh, because I want to sit there. Uh, let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice note. Adrian, it's like when you're sitting down on the bus and the person beside you just sits down and their their leg is touching off your leg and they do not move. It's completely in your personal space. That grinds my gears so much. That happened to me a couple of weeks back and it is so... I actually got up off the seat and moved to a different seat to be honest with you. When somebody is literally touching off your leg, um, it is, yeah, it's horrible. That is total. I will do the exact opposite. If I sit down beside somebody, I will nearly turn at a right angle so that I, I don't in any way uh, touch off them at all. Uh, here's another WhatsApp voice note, which you can send to us to 0877 98 98 98. Bad driving from the bus drivers, jamming on the brakes throwing you from left and right not very comfortable not very safe at all especially if the ground is wet it does my head in okay we're asking you what is that one thing about public transport that just does your head in we all have a story claire what is yours um people who maybe listen to their phones or their ipad especially mummies who have their kids listening to twinkly music for their kids at full volume and here's the thing this is becoming more common people not even using headphones and yep. playing whatever it is they want to play on the yep. speakers on their phone i don't need to hear it that's yeah. your personal stuff i don't need to hear it and it's for that reason that headphones were invented exactly it annoys the budget. It, it actually bugs the hell out of me as well. I was on a Lewis uh, a couple of weeks ago, a packed Lewis, heading up towards um, Houston Station, and there's a woman sitting in the seat, 
um, and she's watching some video on YouTube. And my God, the speakers on her phone were the loudest speakers I've ever heard. And I yeah. don't know what she was playing, but it just sounded rubbish. And everybody on the uh, the tram was tutting. Everyone... <sighs> Yeah, but I don't she, even notice. Yeah, she didn't notice. She absolutely didn't notice. Um, or didn't care. Or didn't care, yeah. That's probably the latter. But no, yes. I, I agree with you. People who think we all want to listen to what they're watching on YouTube, we don't. And we don't. We do not want to hear it. No, no, we, we did, absolutely don't. We're playing it ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. With you on that, Claire. Thanks very much indeed. No. What is that one thing that wrecks your head? about public transport. Text or WhatsApp me right now, 0877 98, 98, 98 and you can send us a WhatsApp voice note to that same number. When someone sits beside you on the bus or the Lewis and starts eating crisps, why? Oh. Uh-oh. Unfortunately, I am that soldier sometimes. No, not all the time, but, uh, you know, I might be getting the bus and I will, um, while I'm waiting for the bus, go into the shop and buy a packet of crisps and maybe eat them on the bus. Uh oh. I'll bear that in mind that it annoys uh, that lady. Wayne is in Ballymun. You're on 98 FM. Wayne, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Wayne, what is the one thing that annoys you on public transport? Well, it's, it's more of a seasonal thing, so it doesn't happen all year round. But okay. in the area I live in, it's uh, constantly set up with international students, so French, Spanish, Italian. Now, it's it's not their fault, but they get the bus in the morning and when they're getting the bus, I have to wait maybe three or four buses to go by full before I can get on the next bus to get to work. It's something I've actually brought up with Dublin Bus before, but all they hear about is full buses, they don't care, it's, oh, we'll take your feedback. And in fact, if, I, if anything, if I'm not mistaken, do they kind of revise their uh, schedule during the summer months so there's probably a few less buses because the kids aren't at school and all that? So that means it, it's po- it makes it more difficult for you to actually get on your bus because... Of the, the the students. Yeah, and there's frequent enough buses generally on normal weekdays without them there, but when they're there, the buses are just constantly full. You're not even able to get on it. At that point, I've had resort to just getting the train, and that's another maybe another two, three kilometres away from me that I have to walk to to get the train, but it's the only way I'm going to get to work on time now because of it. Is it that bad? Whereabouts do you live? Up in Donamede. Up in Donamede. And uh, yeah. at this time of the year, there's so many students around that they fill up the, the bus, so you have to go and get the train. Every morning from half seven till about half nine, every bus going by is full from the mid. Wow. God, I didn't realise there was that many of them. Oh, there's hundreds. <laughs> right, OK. So, um, yeah, I can understand how that would wreck your head as well. So, uh, foreign students on the bus during the summer months. Edgar, what is the one thing about public transport that wrecks your head? Hello, Adrian. How, how are, are you? Edgar? Good, thank you. Uh, the thing which absolutely drives me crazy, when in a rush hour on the Lewis, People, you know, the standing position, holding the pole, and there's loads of people, and they have a backpack. I don't know, they haven't got common sense of not nah, put their backpacks down at their feet, because, uh, like, when it's absolutely full, that backpack taking up a load of space, and it's right in your face, especially when somebody's getting off the Lewis, and the people start moving. And, it, they, and they're swinging oh, around, and they're bashing and their bag off it. you. I personally have a backpack myself, but I always put it down on the... Okay, my, so, the, and in fact, there's, it's just common manners, really, isn't it? That yeah, you, 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 you get on, you might have a backpack on, you take it off, you uh, put it, if you're standing up, you put it at your feet and just uh, and stand over your bag, basically. Yeah, it's absolutely driving me mad, to be honest. It, it's, it's just no common sense, because it's really bad. Like, Dublin public transport is pretty bad, and that even makes it worse, you know? It worse, yeah, it does. Now, I have to ask you, Edgar, just a curiosity question. Where's your accent from? Because I love the way it's mixed now. I'm from Latvia originally. You're from Latvia. Quite, quite a long, and my woman is from Dublin, and I've been walking along, uh, around the Irish people quite a long time. <laughs> I'm just... Uh, I'm multilingual. I love the I love the blend of your Latvian accent and the Dublin accent. It's class. Thanks, Adrian. (laughs) Brilliant. Good to talk to you, Edgar. Thanks very much indeed. Um, Now uh, let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice note. Why hey when you're on the bus and you see a young, well-able person sitting on a seat and they won't give it to an elderly person? Just really does me head in. Bon Jovi, don't tell anybody. (laughs) (laughs) And Debbie, in fact, that's your. Uh, thing that wrecks your head, ignorant people. Yeah, I, I tell it when I when I'm sitting on the bus and you're sitting on the inside and someone on the outside and your staff is coming up. You stand up to get out and instead of just stepping up and standing out to let you out, they just twist their body around 
and yeah, but poor person, you have to squeeze past them to get out. It is so annoying, isn't it? Oh, I just think it's so ignorant. And here's another thing that wrecks my head as well, uh, especially on a Lewis or uh, on a Dart, on a train. People trying to get onto the train yeah. or the tram while there are people still getting off. Seriously. Yeah. Stop being so obnoxiously rude and wait for people to get off. Yeah. It's so annoying, isn't it? Oh, so annoying, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Debbie. Thanks yeah. very much indeed. Uh, let's have a listen to this message. I don't go on public transport very often, but one thing that really annoys me, I've seen happen so many times, is when somebody doesn't give up their seat for a heavily pregnant woman or even a weaker, older person. It's just really rude. Well, Manners are free. That's another message saying the exact same thing. Um, and it, it, we only spoke about this actually a couple of weeks ago about how uh, rude people have become on public transport and just burying their heads in their phones and pretending they don't see a thing when they actually do. They know everything. They can see the pregnant woman standing there, but they bury their head in their phone and pretend that they don't notice her. Martina, you're on 98 FM. Hi, Martina. Hi. It's not necessarily a public uh, a, a pet peeve, mm. but the other day I was on a bus. I was, uh, it was kind of fairly empty-ish. So there was space on the seat beside me. So I left my bag on the seat, which is fine. Uh, the bus came to a stop. There was lots of people getting on. So I took my bag off the seat to make the seat available. As uh, the person who came to get into the seat came along, she was somebody who would have struggled to get past me to get into the seat. So I automatically shuffled over to the side to make the seat available. The nearest push button bell was past her on, on a little on the seat behind on the other side. So in order to get out and get into my seat when my stop was coming up, I got up to go and press the bell, but I couldn't get to it because she had difficulty shifting and letting me out, which meant I missed my stop. Oh, and no. Stop later. And uh, I just thought to myself, I wouldn't do this again because, you know, when you're rushed for time and you're struggling to get somewhere mm. and you're thinking this is making me even later. Uh, yeah. That, that so happened. you were trying to do a good turn, but it kind of backfired, basically. Well, I didn't get off. I didn't get off my stop, yeah. and you know, kind of at my stop. But I just thought, uh, you know, but this, this will always be the case. You know what I mean? This, I'm just, that's not exceptional. That will always be the case. So mm. I feel for people who have restricted mobility or have difficulty with the uh, structure of public transport because they might have to make choices about not sitting down in a seat being available because uh, it's uh, it's not so easy for them to get into it. All right, thank you very much indeed. Uh, putting people there... Uh, sorry, I'm a bus driver. Putting people there... Oh, it doesn't actually make sense, that message. Uh, okay. Um, I hate, says uh, this message, when I'm on the bus and someone is speaking loudly on their phone. Now, I hate it as well. I, it, quite often, if somebody rings me, if I'm on the bus, I'll say, can I ring you back in ten minutes? Because I just hate people. I hate people eavesdropping on my conversation. I was. I'd be able to tell you that uh, the other day, uh, a lady on the bus was to meet uh, Claire outside the school in Ballymun, and she was going to be a bit late. And uh, poor Chantel was going to be left in school, standing outside the gate all by her own. And was there anything anybody could do? Could you ring, ma'am, and see if ma'am could get down to the school? I heard the whole story. I know them all intimately because this lady's conversation was at the top of her voice. Um, Adrian, I hate when you're trying to get off the bus and people don't move out of the way and you end up missing your uh, stop. This happens particularly with groups of uh, students, says uh, Noel. And, um, oh yeah, here we go. On Tuesday, I had my bag on a seat next to me for comfort while the bus was empty. OK, I'll give you the bus being empty. Um, and, oh, sorry, that was Martina that we just spoke to. Was it? Oh, OK, right, sorry about that. And one last one. Uh, my pet peeve on Dublin bus is the price. Well, get a Leap card, because it's much cheaper. If you're paying cash, uh, it is getting more expensive. A Leap card is the only way to go, it has to be said. Um, it, what annoys me about public transport, says this message, is when I reserve my seat on a long train journey and some ignorant yoke sits in my seat and won't move. That whole seat assignment thing on trains is um, ridiculous. And finally, and this is something, again, that happened to me only recently, 
What annoys me on uh, public transport is people's body odour. It drives me mad. I was on a bus coming into work, packed, absolutely packed. Fella sits down beside me and the smell of this guy's breath had me nearly vomiting and I couldn't even move seats. There was nowhere else to go. And the waft off, I was literally reaching as I was sitting there. <laughs> I don't know how he didn't notice, to be quite honest with you. Anyway, you're listening to 98FM. This is Adrian Kennedy. Uh, oh, yeah, on the way after the break, are you a man who is starting to become bald? Because if you are, I want to talk to you. Because, wait, get a load of this, and I want to find out how big an issue this is. A, a new survey has revealed that 45% of men fear being bald more than being single for the rest of their lives. Are you one of those men who's terrified about going bald? Maybe you are starting to recede and it's wrecking your head. I'd love to talk to you on 6797981. Tell me the effect that uh, a receding hairline or starting to lose your hair has on you. Call me right now on 67979981. You can text or WhatsApp 0877 989898. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. With Des Kelly Interiors. For all the latest trends in carpets, vinyls, and wood flooring. Des Kelly Interiors. Where quality flooring costs less. 98 FM. Now, calling all men. Are you bald? Or have you gone bald in recent years? And if so, I want to find out, has it affected your uh, confidence? Well, get a load of this. A new survey has revealed that 45% of men fear being bald more than being single for the rest of their lives. Uh, Celebrities who've had a hair transplant after experiencing hair loss include Wayne Rooney, Gordon Ramsay, Louis Walsh, Mel Gibson. It had been rumoured that David Beckham has had a hair transplant, although he's never admitted to it. And we want to talk to you if you've experienced male baldness. Uh, Did you get slagged for it? But be honest, has your hair loss affected your confidence? Would you consider getting a hair transplant if you could afford it? I'd love to hear from you on 67979981. You can text or WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp voice message to 0877989898. I want to find out the effect going bald has on some men. Call me right now, 67979981. Um, I'm joined on the line by trichologist... Uh, Johan Mares from uh, Premier Hair uh, Restoration Clinic. Uh, Johan, welcome to 98FM. Thank you very much, Adrian. Tell me exactly what a trichologist does. Yeah, so basically trichology is the science of hair and scalp. So a trichologist would deal with um, all the hair loss conditions and also we treat scalp problems. So basically when somebody comes for a consultation, we look at the problem from various angles and we make sure that we discover exactly what is the problem and then we see exactly what can be done for that particular um, patient. Now, tell me then, uh, do most men experience some level of hair loss during their lives? Of course. Um, well, basically, over, over our lifetime, we will lose um, up to 50% of the, of the hair. And a lot of our clients experience hair loss from early age, like, for example, 20 years of age. And, of course, that uh, affects the confidence uh, to a great extent. Why does it affect men's confidence? I happen to be fortunate enough that I'm not going bald um, and I, I, I don't know what sort of effect it would have on me if I were to. What sort of effect does it have on men's confidence? That's a very good question, Adrian. Well, on that note, there is a saying that people are creatures of habit, and that applies to hair also. Majority of us have the same hairstyles for years and years, frames our face in a certain way. Therefore, when we experience hair loss, we feel that we lose part of our identity, hence the confidence can be affected. But of course, hair is not everything, and personality, etc., are certainly more important. However, if hair loss does indeed affect people, the options like hair transplant come into place. 
So what sorts of reasons do men uh, go for the option of a hair transplant? Uh, the reason for a hair transplant? Yes. Why, why do men decide that that's what they want to do? Well, it's because um, they, they feel that um, when they have hair loss, of course, and that affects their confidence to a great extent. So in turn, uh, they, they choose to have the option of a hair transplant because it, they, they regain that, that confidence. It gives them that younger look, and by by doing so, for sure, that affects their 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 life in a in a positive way. So, tell me about the process of uh, getting a hair transplant. What exactly does it involve? So, first and foremost, um, is a consultation. So, at the consultation, as I said, we look at the problem from a holistic viewpoint. So, we discuss the history of the hair thinning and hair loss. We see what other factors are contributing to the problem. And then based on the pattern of the, of the condition, we then see if hair transplant is the right option for them. And very importantly is that we, we, um, we discuss their expectations, Adrian. So expectation is very important because if we think that we can't achieve their expectations, well then certainly we we have to see what options uh, would achieve that. Okay, so in other words, a hair transplant doesn't necessarily suit everybody. Exactly, exactly. And that's what many people don't know. Um, A lot of our our clients come in and they say, I want a hair transplant, Um, budget is not a problem for me, what's the process to have have this um, uh, procedure? So then we say, okay, well, we have to see first if you're suitable for a transplant. In other words, we have to factor in further hair loss. So if a person is at the initial stages of hair loss, well, then possibly transplant may not be the right option for them because we have to project further hair loss. Um, Why is that? Because at the back of our head, where we call it the donor area, that's where we take hairs. So basically, that is a limited um, amount. There is a limited amount of hairs that we can take. So if we see that a person will have an extensive hair loss, well, that, that means that we can't take sufficient hairs from the donor side at the back to um, have a, a good result. In terms of hair transplants, is there a stigma attached to it? I, I, you know, I think of... Uh, people in the public eye who may have had a hair transplant done but never actually admit to having had it done. Is there a bit of a stigma? I would say uh, probably over five years ago uh, there was a stigma attached to it. A lot of people were not discussing this with even their friends. Um, However, since probably Wayne Rooney's hair transplant, that opened up the market as such and it's It's basically perceived as um, just a normal procedure that people do to, like, for example, uh, teeth whitening. So it's it's very common nowadays for people to be more open about about having a procedure. Because, you know, men slag men over going bald. It seems to be something that we're uh, fairly open about slagging people over. Yes. Um, it is something that really does have um, an effect on men. Of course, of course it is. Um, but as I said, in the last in the last few years, that has changed. Of course, to a certain degree, there is still stigma attached, and obviously there are people that um, are a bit more um, secretive about having a transplant. Um, but the general consensus is that you know, it's it's more acceptable as such. Okay, now I know my final question is the same as asking how long is a piece of string, but on average, how much would a hair transplant cost? So the average cost of a transplant is anywhere for, from 5,000 to 10,000 euros. Okay, so it's it's not cheap. That would be the average. That would be the average. Okay, so it's not yeah. a cheap uh, procedure. Uh, but in terms of, you know, men who've had it done... What do they say then afterwards about what it has done for them? Well, as long as as long as we make sure they understand fully what can be achieved with a transplant, then of course they're they're um, if we can achieve those expectations, they're very very happy. Um, a lot of people, for example, this um, having hair loss 
refrains them from going out, uh, refrain, refrains them from um, pursuing uh, a better job. So in, in a sense, you know, hair restoration can mean different things for different people. It can mean a, new, a better job, can mean um, a, a, a relationship, it really depends from case to case, but overall, this positiveness affects their, their life um, to, to a good extent, yes. Okay, Johan Maris from Premier Hair Restoration Clinic in Ireland. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you very much, Adrian, for having me on. And I'd love to hear from you on 6797981. You can text or WhatsApp 0877 98, 98, 98 And I'd love to talk to you if you're one of the 45% of men who fear being bald more, get a load of this, more than being single for the rest of your life. Baldness is a greater uh, fear than being left on the shelf forever. Let's have a listen to this WhatsApp voice message. Adrian, I'd rather go bald than pay 10 grand to get the hair back. <laughs> it is a lot of money. I mean, he said between 5 and 10 grand uh, for a hair transplant. And you see, like I said to uh, Johan a moment ago, I'm fortunate that I... Yeah, I've receded a little bit, but nothing major. Uh, I have a reasonable head of hair. So it's never really been an issue for me, but I don't know. So I, therefore, I don't know how it would affect me if it was, if I was to start going bald. Um, Gary is in Blanche. Gary, welcome to 98FM. Morning, Jane. Hey, Jane. Gary, you went bald when you were 20. Yeah, early 20s I went bald, I did. And how, how did you feel about that? <laughs> got used to it. Like, it wasn't a major thing, like, you know, didn't change me as much and I didn't find my appearance changed. Like, you know, I was my ball, but I didn't, I wasn't conscious about it, you know. You see, and, uh, because I was shocked to hear that 45% of men are more afraid of going bald than being single for the rest of their lives. Um, it, it, did it have any effect on your on your confidence, on your self-confidence? No, it didn't. No, just that about mirrors a lot. That's about it. <laughs> I, okay, so um, it hasn't had an effect. And, and do you think, are you completely bald? Do you shave your head? No, I don't shave my head, no. I've uh, hair at the side, but nothing on top. All right, so you're completely bald on top. Yeah. And w- would you ever think, I- I- if I was to give it to you for free, would you get a hair transplant? No. No, why? People say, people say that, my friends all say that, the baldness suits me rather than just have hair. He said, I showed photographs when I was younger when I had got hair in my early teens and all like that. And he said, no, it doesn't look like you, you know? Yeah, you, because, because you do so kind of get used then. to it. I, I, yeah. I have a mate who uh, is completely bald as well. Uh, I never knew him when he had hair. And then I saw a photograph of him with hair. I was like, really? That? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've gotten used to it. It hasn't affected yourself. Con- and what about women? Do women find it sexy? Right. Uh, Marty's parky stuff. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about that. But do you think she still finds you sexy? Uh, it was just in the plan. Well, well that's but good. That's good. But uh, yeah, you must save a fortune. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, none of that. No from... hairdressing. Don't have to go to hairdresser. <laughs> so yeah, when you get into the shower, does none of this hair washing lark at all? No, no, in and out in five minutes. Ah, that's great. Yeah, there, there, there's something to be said for that. Um, Excuse me, a to showing the top, and that's it. <laughs> All right, good man. Thanks. Uh, Jay, you're on 98 FM. How are you, Jay? Morning, Adrian. Jay, uh, you were going bald as well. I oh, am. Yeah. Does it bother you? Not at all, no. It, what bothers me is it's taking too long. Oh, you, you wish it... all fall out and go, would be great. So where are you bald? <laughs> where exactly are you bald? Uh, I have uh, two bald patches at the top of the back. You know, with your crown in your head? Right. Um, uh, well, I love a double crown, so it's going bald in both of them. Right, and you just wish you'd get on with it then? Yeah, and it's receding at the front as well, <laughs> in the middle. And, um, okay, would you not think of shaving it all then? I do. Oh, you do? Yeah, but it still grows, you know. Yeah, so you have to and keep shaving. And growing back, it makes your head look dirty because it's thicker patches in different places, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay, so you, you it doesn't affect your self-confidence at all? No, at all. No, but it's been shaving your head since I was in your 20s anyway. Oh, before you even started receding and going bald. Yeah, yeah, long time, yeah. And the, I, I just wish it all hurry up and fall out. 
It's it's funny actually because uh, a lot of people still think well it is I, I think it is but anyway um, a lot of people think it's still okay to slag men going bald. Um, I uh, think it is as well. Yeah, uh, and and we <laughs> uh, well I for years have slagged our Jeremy for going bald. He's younger. I won't tell you what the bloke called me when he answered the, when I answered the phone. You're baldy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I call Jeremy that every day of the week, so, yeah, okay. Um, thanks for your call. Let's have a listen to... Oh, oh, yeah, here's a text. I'm 38 and bald since I was 24. Being bald never bothered me at all. I've been shaving my head since I was a young fella, and I genuinely believe having hair wouldn't suit me, says uh, that message. Um, two and a half grand for a hair transplant in Turkey says uh, that message. Oh, in fact, another one on that same theme. I went to Istanbul in January for a hair transplant. Uh, got two and a half thousand grafts. It cost me 2,300 for flights, hotel, etc. The clinic I went to couldn't do enough for me. The hotel was as good as any I've ever been to. Got chauffeured around in a limo for the three days I was there. The clinic I went to are doing around five procedures a day and they couldn't be more professional. That procedure Procedure here in a place like Black Rock, uh, you're talking about 15 to 20 grand. It's only a five or six hour procedure. No one should be paying 10 grand uh, for that. I, I always heard that it was very painful. Is it not very painful? Five or six hours of a painful procedure. Is it painful? Here's a WhatsApp voice note. Hello, Adrian. Um, I started going bald while chinning in the late 20s, I did, and I sort of had a breakdown for a couple of months, like, but. I have to say, you get used to it. Um, the missus loves it now when I shave my head. She loves the feel of it, the look of it. She said it suits me better. And uh, she couldn't imagine me any other way. But uh, I think baldness is like the new hairdo for men, to be honest with you. It is for an awful lot of men. And yeah, I, I always wonder, if, you, if you're starting to go bald and it's starting to look silly, just get rid of it all. Uh, Bill, finally, you started going bald 10 years ago. Does it bother maybe, you? Maybe I'll like, just bother you in the slice. I couldn't care less. Yeah, like, okay. It's okay. I mean, you can't actually... stop the aging process. You can't stop the aging process. Yeah, but it's, not, only... it's not just aging because some men go bald and others don't. So it's not just mm. to do with aging. Well, my brothers and I have a, all have... I saw our brothers and we all have full heads of hair. I don't want to went bald. But like I said, one of my brothers said he lost all his hair go mental. But I actually couldn't care less. I really couldn't. It, 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 I was like a man with kids. I just couldn't care less. And is it because you just don't, is it because you just don't care about your appearance or do no, you I just, just don't care about have hair on it. No, you know, lovely hair. <laughs> he used to comment on me hair, how lovely it was. But um, there was some, you know, I got married or whatever hair for that. I just don't care. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Um, and, and, and like I said, are you well, shocked? I'm looking at myself in the big shop window here and I look gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> are you the shocked? Looking at me, going, looking at him on the radio, you know? Well, are, you, are you shocked by this survey that shows 45% of men? Absolutely. I'm amazed. I just think that men were very low self esteem. That's just my personal opinion. If you see the going balls, is, you know, you'd, you'd rather be bald than be sort of lonely or whatever the, whatever the quote was. Yeah. The sort of serious you're on with you. No, all right, good to talk to you, Bill. Thanks very much. No, have a good day. That's funny. You're baldy get because apparently we can still slag each other over baldness. It's, a, it's acceptable. All right, thank you very much indeed uh, for your calls. Let me just read... Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, one last message that came in to us. Here it is. I think it affects younger men more so than older married men. Once you are settled down, it doesn't matter as much. But I've had uh, women who said I'm good looking, uh, but don't like the bald look, says Carl. Thanks very much indeed. This is 98FM. 98 98FM's 98 Dublin Talks. With Des Kelly Interiors. For all the latest trends in carpets, vinyls and wood flooring. Des Kelly Interiors. Where quality flooring costs less. 98 FM. And this is Adrian Kennedy. Last week, as you will know, we had our award ceremony for 98 FM's Best of uh, Dublin, where we found 16 incredible people and organisations that make a difference to our city. And you, it, it was a really enjoyable experience uh, presenting the awards last week. And throughout the campaign of Best of Dublin, 
The one thing which stood out to us was just how many thriving local villages and main streets there are across uh, Dublin. And over the next few weeks, we'll be shining a light on the many villages and towns across our capital with our Buy Local campaign. This is a 98FM campaign to support independent local businesses. For many parts of the city, these local businesses are the backbone of uh, communities. Now, 98FM uh, has been part of Dublin communities for 30 years years now so we've decided to chat to local retailers and shoppers to find out what it is that makes their locality so special so today our jeremy is on the north side checking in on some local businesses thanks very much adrian today i am in finglas so I'm here with Sinead. Sinead, how long are you working here in Paws News Agents? 18 years. It's been here 40 years in Finglas and Cardersford Road, is that yeah, right? that's right, yeah. So it's been through the Celtic Tiger, it's been through the recession and survived it all. Oh, that's because they've got staff. Is that, is that the reason? Friendly, yeah. Well, I was standing in the shop there for a few minutes. You know, it's quite busy, which is why we're in the back of the shop. It's quite busy and you have a long queue there. And the one thing I noticed is the staff know every single person that comes into the shop on a first name basis. That's brilliant, isn't it? And it is. Come here, after all those years, they're like more friends. Do you know what I mean? We, te- we have a bit of banter, the whole works, you know? So they all have their reti- the routines, I assume, that the same people come in at the same time every day and buy the buy the same the same things? Ah, yeah, should we do not your usual? Some of them is here that long, like, you know, we just know Don't what you- they want. What's your usual? Yeah, please. The one thing I love about this shop, Paul's News Agents, is what I call an old school news agent in that it sells anything. You can get you can get everything and you can get you can get a, a packet of sweets, but you can also get washing powder in it and you can get newspapers. Ah, we sell everything. Anything you need, we'll get it in here. So how important because this is what we want to focus on, we want to highlight, how important is it that locals shop here? Because, you know, think this you're only a bus ride away from the city centre. So how important is it that people shop locally? Right, well the way it is, Paul employs us local girls here. Just five five of us and then we have a little hairdressers as well. You know, but there are local staff that walk here. So you, you all live in the all you all live in the community. The area, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And you know everyone, everything's set. If somebody needs something they come in here. If somebody's sick you're running out to get chairs, you know. It's just So it's that little touch that you wouldn't get in the shop where people where people don't know you, isn't that right? Oh come here, they come in and Sinead. You get called Sinead, Terry, Brenda, Sue, Tina, Louise. Rosalie, you know, <laughs> and you're like, we just answer, yes. You know. So what would you what would you say to people about the importance of, of shopping local and why people should should always shop locally? Well, they should, because like over the last few years and all, like, you know, my sort of hours and all have been cut, you know, to take the cut because people can't afford. So Louise does her best, gets in deals and the whole lot to try and keep the locals coming in here. Do you know what I mean? Like it is, Paul's here 40 years. Which is a long time for a business, a long, isn't long it? long time, you know, so like... I don't know, it's just, it's, everyone's friendly. Yeah, and I think that helps sort of, do you know what I mean? You went to a shop on the road to you, you're not going to go back in. So it's a kind of warmth about the place, do you know what I mean? So we're now in the heart of Finglas Village in a travel company called Wallace Travel, and I am joined by Michael. How are you, Michael? Uh, very good, very good. Now, you were definitely here a long time, and the reason I know that is because I booked a holiday with you guys to Iceland. I think at the time you were the only travel company doing Iceland, and that was a, that was back when I had money, which yeah. was a long time ago. Yeah. How long are you operating in Finglas? Uh, well, the company started in, uh, we're 50 years next year, um, so the company's 50 years old next year, but we moved to Finglas in about 1984. Uh, so we've been in, in Finglas since 1994, serving a community here, yeah. That's a, that's a long time, isn't it? It absolutely is a long time to keep the doors open, and there's been a lot of changes uh, in the travel industry and in Finglas uh, in the last 30 plus years here, so yeah. But well, the, the village, I've spent the last half an hour walking through the village, it's it's packed. I yeah. mean, this is a this is a weekday, uh, weekday morning, and it's absolutely packed, and all the, all the businesses seem to be doing well, there's lots of customers. Yeah, we're pretty good, we get good support from the community, from the local uh, uh, GA clubs and football clubs and that, and yeah, so the, the, uh, I think things people are good. They recognise that uh, you know that they have a, a community base here, and uh, we kind of work on work on it. And yeah, they're pr- pretty good to support the community. Yeah. Now the reason we want to do a travel agents is because it's the it's the one industry, I suppose, that has had so much competition from from online. Yeah. Apart from other com- other companies and other uh, businesses, travel companies have have suffered. How have you kept it going? 
and how do you fight against against online? Well, I suppose it's it's all about quality of service. So I suppose we're we're, we're all travel professionals here. We've got we've got folks here that have twenty plus years of experience. So I suppose we we so know. Are you saying those girls sitting there have been everywhere? Have yeah, they? Yeah, they've been everywhere. There's been, yeah, Joanne there's been everywhere, and Emma and these guys, these girls have been all over the place. So okay, so unlike online, where you don't get to talk to somebody, you know, say, say for fragments sake, you want to go to Lake Garda, uh, you you can't talk to somebody online. Whereas I'm sure Joanne has probably has probably been there, and she'll tell you. Yeah, she's she's probably been there, and and um, we've probably sent lots of people there, and we can you know we have good recommendations and uh, from from our own visits there, and also then through network. So I suppose the travel agents we work through a recognised uh, distribution service. So and we're also we're backed by the Commission for Aviation Regulation. So I suppose unlike online, if anything happens, um, you've got to come back here and you're insured with a, with, 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 a, with a, a travel agency. You know. So. How many people are you employing here? Fifteen people here. Wow. Well, are they are they local people? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Yeah, I'm a culture. I'm up from Kilkenny. But I was about to say that. That's, that's not a famous accent. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. But most most of the, most of the guys here are, are are from the locality, and we work with 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 the local uh, schools here as well. So we, we we get people in here on on work experience, and there's a travel agents course on uh, just up the road there. So yeah, we we have a youth development program here. Brilliant! Well. I never thought I never thought that existed. Yeah. So. Explain to people how important it is that, that, that people in Fingus and people in other areas continue to, to shop locally. Well, I suppose, look, we've all seen over the last 10 or 15 years during the downturn with, you know, with businesses going and, and, and premises closing and, and some, some areas looking like a bit of a ghost town. But thankfully in Fingus, that wasn't the, the case. You know, most of the business were able to keep their, their head above water. But I suppose if you want to have a core and you want to have a centre to your village here, you've got to support local. And, and um, even though we're, we're local, but we distribute global. So, you know... It's Being here that long, you have seen generations coming up I suppose you've seen you know mothers coming in with their little kids booking Disneyland and now those kids are now growing yeah, up yeah. Do, you, do you know the customers oh no, yeah customers? very yeah very much so we have we have we have uh, families that are coming through here so they, we, we'd first see them going on their family holiday and now we see the lads going off for their their, their post leaving cert and their their college so you so can they see literally, they've grown up with you see them all grown up with us here and they'll come back to us and, and some some of the guys have, have, have been here and they you know they, they've got very good relationships over the years here yeah exactly. and that's that's the important thing isn't about local businesses keeping the relation the relations going with the local community yeah, look i suppose there's a trusting too and because the, the most of the staff here live locally as well so they're they're part of the community so they're like it's, it's all about keeping keeping ourselves going and, and like we're going to be here if if, if we de, if, if we deliver well and have a good holiday people come back in and show us their photos and tell us how they got on and all it's that trust stuff. isn't there's it there's a trust thing there's a trust so our last stop in Fingus Village is in, well of course the centre of every community is usually the coffee shop, it's where people meet every day, have coffee and we're in Food Fair on McKee Avenue, is that where we are? McKee Avenue, yes. And uh, I'm joined by Martin, you're very welcome along to 90 of Thank you. First of all, how long have you been here? 22 years. 22 years. Yeah. Yourself? Yes. You, you set up this, did you? Yes. It was a different, different place in 20, 22 years ago? It was ago. quite different. And how have you survived through the, the, the tough times, the recession, the whole lot? Uh, we just did. We just had to buckle down and uh, just do our best, and it, we came through it. And you seem to be doing well. I mean, it's, it's yeah, mid-morning here. The, the, the place is absolutely yeah. uh, packed. There's very few uh, empty seats in it. Mm. Are they all locals? Are they regulars? Uh, all local. Uh, all our business is local, and, of course, we do a bit of outdoor uh, you know, christings, that sort of thing as well, and that helps. Would you see the same faces coming in every absolutely, day? Absolutely, absolutely. How important is it that, that people from the community shop locally? Oh, sure. It, 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 this place couldn't stay alive. Uh, super value across the way couldn't stay alive. The furniture sh shop across the way couldn't stay alive without local people. How many staff do you employ here? Uh, oh, God, about, about 12. Well, and that's something that I think people need to consider, isn't it, when they're shopping locally, that you employ local people? I, I assume they're all from the area, are they? Well, most, most of them are, but uh, not very far, anyway. Yeah, so what would you say to people uh, is the most important thing about what can you offer that other places can't as, well, as a local business? Well, this is a family business, you know, we, you know, the person who owns it is at the back of the counter and if you want to speak to him, all you have to do is say, can I talk to you? So we're available. Okay. So it's not a case of a faceless organisation no. where you don't know, you know can I speak to the manager? No. The we're not a coffee house from America or 
from Great Britain or wherever, we're local, real local, and we live local. And I suppose that's what it is. I was standing here looking at the, the, your staff um, serving the customers. They're all serving with a smile. Yeah, they, well, I hope so. They hope so. They seem, they seem to know the customers. Are they on first name basis? Ah, a customers? lot of them, yes, of course. There are people coming, coming in here since the first day we opened the door 22 years ago. Really? Same customers coming back? That's very unique, isn't yeah. it, that you get that? Mm, absolutely. Well, I wish you the best for the future, and uh, thanks for talking to us, Mark. Not at all. Thank you. All right, and that is our uh, Jeremy. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Jeremy. 98FM encouraging you to buy local. We're back again tomorrow morning at 10. Andy Clark is on the way. In the next hour, he's got some great music lined up like these. With Des Kelly Interiors. For all the latest trends in carpets, vinyls, and wood flooring. Des Kelly Interiors. Where quality flooring costs less. 98 FM.